Hello. The Cassandras have been warning of a crisis for a decade now. The spectre of inflation was called first as a risk of quantitative easing following the banking crisis back in 2008. Now, post-pandemic, with global debt at record levels, supply bottlenecks around the world, and wholesale gas prices up tenfold, inflation has arrived. Many fear interest rate rises to control inflation will create havoc, recession, and hardship across the globe. Inflation is already at 10% in Brazil, and interest rates there have risen four times in the past year. Will government debt come back to bite us and the magic money tree turn out not to be so magical after all? Could we be heading for the biggest economic shock that we've ever known? Or are the fears misguided? Inflation, a temporary blip, and government borrowing and spending not only proven right for the pandemic, but for all future policy. Well, to debate one of the most important questions of our era, I've got three fantastic speakers. We've got Steve Hankey, who is one of the world's leading experts on measuring and stopping hyperinflation and a former economic advisor to the Reagan administration. We have Isabella Kaminska, who is a columnist for the Financial Times and lead editor of um, FT Alphaville, the FT's market and finance blog. And we have Polly Toynbee, a British author and journalist who has written for The Guardian for over 20 years. And she's authored several books. Amongst the most important are The Lost Decade, 2010 to 2020, and The Verdict, a book about the labour years in British government. My name's Rana Mitter, and I'll be your host for tonight. Are current levels of inflation putting us on the brink of economic disaster? And to start us off with that, I'm delighted to invite Steve Hankey. Steve, over to you. Rana, thank you. Uh, great to be with you. Let me begin by paraphrasing a dictum of Milton Friedman's. Inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, not something caused by temporary supply chain disruptions and accompanying shortages. So if we follow that dictum, uh, we and we look at inflation, we have to go back to the origin and the origin is always the money pump. How, how, how fast is the money supply growing? That will determine whether we have overall inflation or not. And I'm measuring inflation in many countries around the world. And let me just go through the top eight right now. I measured the inflation rate this morning. Now in all those countries, the money supply is growing very rapidly, and that's why you've got so much inflation. But if you look back historically, let me turn to the world hyperinflations, just to put these numbers into context a little bit. And a number of years ago, I wrote the chapter in the Rutledge Handbook of Major Economic Events in History, and the chapter on world hyperinflations contains all, all of the big ones, uh, except a few. Uh, actually, when I wrote this, there were 58 hyperinflations. Today, now there are 62. But Hungary, uh, August 1945, was the top one. Prices were doubling every 15 hours. Zimbabwe, as it turns out, November of 2008, prices were doubling every 24.7 hours. We go on down the line in Germany, which of course is the most famous hyperinflation of all times. It comes in number five on, on the list of world hyperinflations, 3.7 days in Germany. So it, it was taking about four times longer to double the prices in Germany in, 1940, in 1923 than it was in 1945 in Hungary. So, it's, it's all a money game. Where is the money supply going? And that's going to tell you where inflation is going. Thanks very much indeed, Stephen. Thank you for that historical perspective. My, my day job is as a historian of the Chinese Civil War. And as you'll know very well, in 1947 to 48, it also had one of the world's most uh, fast moving inflationary cycles at that, uh, that point. So it happens in many places. Let me now turn for our second um, pitch to this question of our current levels of inflation putting us on the brink of economic disaster to Isabella Kaminska. Isabella, over to you. So 
here I'm I'm looking at it from a, a UK perspective in, in a in, in a certain way. Um, so we are sitting here right now and we are experiencing shortages. We've had a petrol crisis. Gas prices are uh, going up. Um, we are facing bare shelves. There's an HGV, HGV uh, driver shortage. And it does feel very much like there is a perfect storm um, in terms of inflation. So um, we've had today Andrew Bailey, the gov governor of the um, Bank of England, actually slightly spook the markets in um, suggesting that the Bank of England is going to raise rates earlier than previously expected. We are supposedly, we, we are currently at 0.1% um, and the market is now supposedly looking to price in 0.25%. Um, the big dilemma and the big kind of controversy in markets, I guess, is whether or not a interest rate hike in such an environment is going to actually do any uh, any good. Because if we are facing a stagflationary situation, then there is a big fear that actually uh, interest rate hikes will simply um, impede growth further and uh, make the problem worse in some ways. Um, but there is another angle um, which is being overlooked, and that is the fact that we uh, we are not just you know coming out of COVID, and and there is the great uh, debate over whether this inflation is transitory or not, and whether many of these bottlenecks will ease themselves over the year over the next few months or years. Um, this also coincides, I would argue, with the great sort of ESG phenomenon, and that is um, the push to sort of starve the fossil fuel markets of capital um, in a in a in a bid to kind of push the green agenda forward. Um, and for years now, we've talked about this in a very positive light, um, but I don't think uh, it's really been ap appreciated to what degree that can be inflationary in its own right. So coupling the lockdown uh, sort of tra transitory issues, you have this sort of push on the greenflation side as, as it's being dubbed now. Um, and we're seeing the brunt of that in terms of global energy costs going up this year, uh, not least because um, there has been this epic underinvestment in the energy sector, which is partly cyclical because obviously COVID, um, amongst other things, saw last, you know, in 2020, we saw March 20, I can't remember now, Around March 2020, we saw, you know, oil prices go in almost into net. Well, they did momentarily go into negative territory, which is not exactly a great um, sort of incentive to invest in the in the energy sector. So there's a cyclical uh, side to that story. But on top of that, there is this stranded asset issue, which is that nobody wants to invest because they fear that um, the investments will never get used. And, and energy investing is very long term horizon focused. So if you're not going to get your money back in, say, 20, 30 years, because uh, by 2030, 20 2035, you know, these assets can't be utilized to, to the degree that you might otherwise want them to. So that's that's where I'm looking at things. Um, that's the perspective I'm looking at things from. Thanks very much indeed, Isabella, and plenty there for us to uh, to, to chew over. Um, Polly, could I now turn to Polly Toynbee for the final pitch on this question? Are current levels of inflation putting us on the brink of economic disaster? Over to you. I think we have to start from a position of great humility. I think that economics itself is in a state of great crisis. And we are at the moment finding that we know less and less and that fewer and fewer of the old rules seem to hold. Um, I don't think we know what money is or how it works. And uh, the arrival of cryptocurrency, for instance, has been quite a shock to the system because it goes against all the rules. Does it work? Does it not work? Is it a terrifying, dangerous, explosive element in our economies? We have a, a budget next week and our Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, sounds as if he's going to cleave to all the old economic conventional, possibly untruths, um, a fixed idea that um, spending must be covered by, by taxation that you cannot in any one year um, allow the, the uh, deficit to rise. We're not sure that that's true. Uh, or we're certainly not sure that that medicine isn't a great deal worse than the disease it's trying to cure. Um, we know the banks create money. We've seen QE as being an extraordinary way of creating money, creating huge amounts of extra assets for the very wealthy. Uh, it hasn't been a very satisfactory way of of, of dealing with the the, the twenty uh, the two thousand and nine crisis, um, I think it turns out that there is a kind of magic money tree, but nobody knows how tall it can grow. 
how 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 long it can last. Um, what's certain is that as long as stable countries, and we've just heard Professor Hanke talking about very extreme collapsed societies, collapsed politics, collapsed economies, which I don't think are very relevant for the rel relatively solid economies of, of our own countries. Um, we don't, you know, we can borrow as much as lenders are willing to lend. And at the moment, they seem very willing to lend because they don't know where else to put their money. So there doesn't seem to be as much difficulty in um, constantly replenishing the magic money tree. I think any idea of return to that old monetarism would be a serious, a serious error. I think raising interest rates now would be catastrophic. Um, we know immediately that how how it's how bad its effects will be, but we don't know what not raising interest rates might do and whether how bad its effects might be. And if you know one thing and not the other, then you should use the precautionary principle and you should not raise interest rates now. It doesn't appear that wages are driving uh, its prices are raw materials and supplies. Um, not wages. Wages are not rising in, in Britain significantly. Well, maybe for a few HGV drivers, but not for anybody else much, certainly not rising above the rate of inflation. OK, so let's not repeat the big errors that this country made in 2010, when by uh, imposing strict austerity uh, uh, under George Osborne and David Cameron, uh, turned off the taps. It meant that we were slowest to recover uh, from the uh, the great financial crash. Uh, the great austerity did terrible harm socially and economically, uh, and we have been behind and we were least prepared as a result for the COVID crisis. We were more vulnerable than other equivalent countries. So let's uh, hold on to the doctors, uh, the doctor's principle, first do no harm. Let's not make things worse by turning off the taps now. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.